Do you ever see something obvious that you should know where it is, and yet you can't find it? Last week I talked about that when it comes to Mark chapter 1, how they missed Jesus. And today I'm going to talk about three ways that we miss what God is doing around us. And here's what I want to talk about just real quick. And we're going to look at this today, so I want to set the table for you. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, you ready for this? Missed Jesus. They looked for the Messiah, but because they were looking the wrong way, they missed it. And here's what I want you to know. If you are not careful, you will miss what God wants to do in your life as you are looking or preferring something else. If you're not careful, you will miss what's happening with people that you love right now because you are focused on the wrong things. It is easy to do as much as it's easy for us to get distracted in life and lose things and not be able to come up. With them. We tend to evaluate things based on our preferences instead of going to God's word. Here's what I want you to know. We need to allow God to evaluate our hearts each day. To spend time in prayer. To spend time in his word. So that we don't miss what God is doing. And even what he's doing in the people around us. Because we spend too much time worrying about the ways people do things. And that's what Mark chapter 2 is all about. It's all about the Pharisees didn't like the way that Jesus was doing things. Now, I worked 25 years ago. I was a school teacher. It's hard to believe it's been that long. And when I was a school teacher, I had to work during the summer in order to survive. Most people who are school teachers understand that. Uh, and, and so the truth is, so during the summer, I actually worked at a plant nursery. And at this plant nursery, uh, my job was basically to sit at a dark dirt pile in the middle of a sunny field in Florida in July with all the humidity coming off that black dirt pile and take little plants and take a bigger bucket, put black dirt in the bigger bucket, put the little plant in the bigger bucket, and then give it back to where it would be taken back to the field. Now, there were three people that were sitting at the pile and three people that would bring the plants to us. And so the guys who were right next to me, the people bringing the plants to them would pull their little cart right up behind them, drop the plants off and go away. The person who was bringing my plants would go to the other side of this huge dirt pile. I mean, it was so high. It was as high as our building this morning. And she would go to the other side of the dirt pile and take off two plants at a time and bring them to me and set them down. Well, after a few hours of this, I said to her, um, hey, you know, those guys, they're bringing their plants right there. Why don't you think about that? Wouldn't that be easier than walking around the pile? And she got furious. Who do you think you are? And then she said this. And as hillbilly as I can say it, it's not even close to how hillbilly she said it. She looked at me. She said, I have a system. I have a system. I've been doing it this way forever. And I'm going to keep doing it this way. Hey, whatever you want. And I was thinking in my head, dumbest simp system I've ever seen. Now, to this day, if you say to me these words, I have a system. I have Tourette's about those words. And if you say it to me, just blatantly, just you're talking and you say, Eric, I have a system. I will mutter and say these words in hillbilly tone every time. I will look at you and go, I have a system. And it just happens. So if you say, Eric, you know, I have a system. I'll go, I have a system. Before you can even finish your sentence, it is so ingrained in my brain because all I could think all summer was the amount of time this person was wasting. The amount of energy this person person was wasting because they were doing something because they had always done it that way. Now listen, we all think we're not like that, but we're all like that. There is some area in your life, I can promise you right now, where you think this is the way I've done it, this is the way I've always done it, so I know it's the right way to do it. And we have a hard time being flexible when things change. So here are three things we're going to look at today. These are just three of them. Three of the ways we miss. We miss things a lot of ways, but these three ways are primary ways. Number one, we focus on the past. Now, if you ever get caught up in unforgiveness, if you ever get caught up in the way we used to do things, 
I have a system, then you may struggle with this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees struggle with this. Listen to this. We're picking up in Mark chapter 2. Jesus is at most likely Peter's house, by the way. And by the way, if you remember Mark, Peter was talking to Mark and telling him the stories. These are not in order of when they happened. But Peter was telling him the stories. And of course, something that happened at Peter's house would be important. And most likely, this was Peter's house for many reasons we're not going to go into today. And here's what happened. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man. By the way, I can't wait to meet these four people in heaven. Actually, all five, but, but these four people. And say, what was the scene? Bringing him a paralyzed man carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they went home. By the way, I think there's going to be story after story after story that we hear that happened. You cannot tell me that this is the only man who people were trying to bring to Jesus. But these four men didn't let that stop them. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus. Now, I don't know if there was an insurance adjuster present, but I'm sure he was not happy. By digging through it, and then it says he lowered the mat. Now, something we miss in the English version of this is it lowered the mat. What we miss is in the Greek, this word for mat was a poor man's mat. It was a mat used for begging. So the people that, that read this would understand early on that this was a poor man. We would assume that anyway because he was lame. He was not able to work. He would need to beg for financial support. And so here he was on his financial support mat, which was being lowered in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, it doesn't say his faith, it says their faith. He looked up, he saw these people who had dug through a roof that was made of thatch and, and tar and, and whatever they had at that time. They dug through the roof. And they lowered him. Don't ask me where they found rope. But they found some rope. And they lowered him right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Sons, your sin are, sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Time out. So I want to give you some background here. You need to understand there are these two religious groups, Pharisees and Sadducees. Now here's what's interesting. Remember, it was crowded all the way out where the guys couldn't even get to the house. But the religious leaders found their way to the best seats in the house. They got there early. Now, you don't know why they got there early. Did they get there early because they were trying to see who Jesus was? My guess is they got there early so they could have the best seats to criticize Jesus. And you have to understand, too, that Pharisees and Sadducees, here's what they believed. They believed that if you were poor, it was because of sin. Either your sin or the sin of a parent's. Because certainly, if you had money, it would show that God's blessing is on you. And if you didn't have money, it showed that God's curse is on you. By the way, there's people who preach this today. There's pastors that feel like they have to buy the nicest car in town because they feel like I'm blessed and I have to prove to other people I'm blessed. And most of us know somebody who works for a multi-level marketing firm who has the same Belief. Sorry, multi-level marketing people. I still love you. And so they felt like because this man had two strikes against him, not only was he poor, but he was also paralyzed. So it was either his sin or his parents' sin. And then Jesus, first thing, says, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you know the background? Do you not understand how this works? See, the Pharisees and Sadducees had taken Old Testament scripture and twisted the idea of God's blessing to mean financial blessing. Does that sound familiar today? They had twisted the idea of blessing to mean physical blessing. If you were healthy, you were blessed. And if you were unhealthy, you were not. Boy, I've heard that taught in some churches. And Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, whoa, 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 you don't understand. You're blaspheming. You're claiming to be God. And then it continues. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. Boy, aren't you glad you don't have thought bubbles on your head all the time? You ever talk to somebody and they say, how are you doing today? And you think, horrible. But you say to them, Fine. And if you had a thought bubble, it would say, and I wouldn't tell you if I was doing good or bad, right? It's a good thing we don't have thought bubbles, but Jesus knew their thought bubbles. He said to them, 
Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man, that's how Jesus described himself, this is a, a way of showing that he was God, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I love this, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now, now listen, that man could have easily looked at Jesus and said, uh, I've been here for a long time. This is what I've always done. This is how I make my living. This is, you don't understand, I have to go out and get a real job if I get better. But here's what it does. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anyone like anything like this. Now listen, in the middle of this miracle, everybody said, this is amazing. And the Pharisees and Sadducees said, this is blasphemy. Because Jesus did not do things the way they thought he should do things. They had grown up with a way of doing things. And even though what they had done is twisted scripture, they now began to use that to say, but this means Jesus isn't the Messiah. So we have a dog at home named Montana. She's the big dog. We have little dogs and big dogs. And this big dog, she's the sweetest dog in the world with the worst hair in the world. It sheds everywhere. But one thing about Montana is if there is thunder anywhere, anywhere, Montana gets terrified. Now, the little dogs are fine. They will bark at the lightning. They think they're going to eat the lightning. Montana goes and finds a place to hide. She used to hide under the bed until my mom kept feeding her pepperonis. And now she can't get under the bed anymore. So she goes in the closet. And so yesterday there was thunder and she would follow me around the house everywhere I went. Anywhere I was, Montana was right next to me. Why? Because she was terrified because something might happen. Because in the past, something happened. Do you live your life that way? Always looking back? Maybe somebody hurt you in the past that you need to forgive. Maybe you don't want to trust people anymore because somebody hurt you in the past. Maybe you don't want to come to church anymore because somebody at church was a jerk. There's a lot of jerks at churches. Not our church, of course. I mean, other than the pastor, right? But people are imperfect. They mess up. They blow it. And so you have a choice. Are you going to live in defeat your whole life? Or are you going to live in the present letting God tell you what matters today? Because if we don't, we can, we can be missing the miracles that God is doing today. Let me tell you how to practically apply this. When's the last time you thought and said, God, what miracles are you doing around me right now? When's the last time you really paid attention to what God was doing in people's lives around you? And even, listen, we pray many times for God to do a miracle and then he does it and we've already forgotten about it. When's the last time you looked back and thanked God for helping you make it through a hard time in your life? Have you had hard times in your life that you prayed that God would help you make it through? Are you still here? Then he helped you make it through it. When's the last time you said, God, thank you for those miracles? So we focus on the past. That's how we get lost. Number two, we choose prejudice. We choose prejudice. Now, prejudice, the word prejudice is the idea of having a preconceived opinion. Not based on reason or actual experience. Now, I don't know if you've done what I've done this summer. Where you had your sunglasses on outside. And then you walked into your house. And you thought, man, it is dark in here. Hey, can somebody turn some lights on in this house? There is a problem with this. Hey, why do you, why, can, can we turn a couple lights? I can't see at all. We need more. Can we open a few curtains? And we tend to look at life based on what we have on. And so often, my poor sweet wife will look at me and go, Honey, did you know you still have your sunglasses on? Oh. Oh. And this is where the idiot sign. I need an idiot sign that just comes on. I feel like an idiot now. By the way, that would be on a lot. We have a way of looking at life because of there's been experiences that we've had where maybe somebody hurt us. And instead of just applying that hurt to that one person, that church person who was a jerk, we then say all church people are jerks. 
By the way, the funniest thing I ever hear is church people are hypocrites. Did you know everybody's a hypocrite? I, I've seen people who talk about physical fitness eat french fries and pizza. You're a hypocrite. What does a hypocrite mean? So a hypocrite literally is not somebody who doesn't do what they say. A hypocrite is a person that pretends that they always do what they say. Do you see the difference? So real hypocrisy is when you pretend you're better than you are. We used to call that putting on airs. There used to be a British show called Keeping Up Appearances. You remember that show, Mike? And this lady always tried to pretend that she was more than she was. She would try to hide her family from her other friends because she didn't want them to know. When we choose prejudice, we choose to look at people and instantly judge them for what we think they are or who they are because of where they belong or what they look like or the experience that we had, but not with that person. We decide how things are going to go before we even talk to somebody. We judge somebody on Facebook before we've even watched the video or read the article. We see the beginning of an article and we prejudge the person who wrote the article before we even look at it. Can I give you something that you can do on Facebook that you maybe haven't tried yet? Scrolling, scrolling, you don't have to read them all. It's not a big deal if you do. I don't know why I'm doing that to sailing, sailing. There you go. So... Mark chapter 2, 13 to 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. By the way, this is awesome. I don't know if you know, sound travels better over water. And it travels better in water. Did you know that? That's why when you're swimming in water and a boat is coming, you can't tell which direction it's coming from. Did you know that? Because the sound gets to both your ears at almost the same time. So you can't tell if a boat is coming from the right or the left. And when you're on top of water, there's no resistance. So Jesus would sit on a boat in the water and it was a perfect microphone for him to teach people. So he's teaching behind the lake. A large crowd gave to him. By the way, another plus of teaching by a lake. It tends to be cooler by the lake. If you don't have air conditioning, can I encourage you? Go near the water. It's July. Find water. Began to teach him as he walked along. He saw Levi, who later we'll call Matthew, son of Alphaeus, which is a great name. What's it all about? Son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. By the way, this tax collector's booth was basically like a toll booth. But here's how it would work. You would come through town, and this was a primary road, and you would come through the town. Now realize that Matthew, who was a Jew, went and took a job with Rome. It would be like if the Chinese invaded America and said, hey, we need a few of you to be tax collectors. The pay is really good. And if you want to tax a little extra, we're not going to give you a problem. Go for it. How would you feel about those people? So people would come up with their donkey and with their cart. The tax collector would stand up. He'd look around and he'd say, hey, you owe me $100. What do you mean I owe you $100? Well, if not, I can just take some of this stuff. All right, here you go. And, and they had certain fees, but they were allowed a lot of leeway. So the Jews hated tax collectors. And yet the first person that we hear about here in Mark chapter 2, one of the first people that Jesus chooses is somebody who other people hate. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, that's Matthew, many tax collectors, and I love this, and sinners, they, they differentiated them. Why? They considered tax collectors worse. Like you had all your normal sinners. Like, you know, you had your prostitutes and your thieves and your other problem makers. And then even worse, tax collectors. These were traitors, cheaters. And so that's why in the Bible it separates them because they hated tax collectors so much. Tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. There were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors. Here they are at the front seats again. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, but Jesus had some great hearing, didn't he? Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, 
Pharisees and Sadducees felt like if somebody was a sinner or a tax collector, what you needed to do was avoid them at all cost. Jesus said, if I see a tax collector or sinner, my job is to help heal them. Now you notice that Jesus didn't say, I'm partying with tax collectors and sinners. I've seen people use this passage to talk about, well, I just hang around in bars with my friends to witness to them. By the way, I've never had a friend who had a trouble with alcohol that then later tried to save his friends who were also alcoholic that didn't fall back into alcohol. You've got to be careful what you pursue. But you also have to be careful what you avoid. Jesus never avoided the people. He avoided the sin. Jesus never went out of his way to push people away. He did push sin away. We know that Jesus was sinless regardless of what people in the media say. I don't know if you heard that this week. One of the media members that knows nothing apparently about scripture said, you know, Jesus admitted he was a sinner. Nay, nay. Nay, nay. It's, it's what Christianity stands on is the fact that Jesus was not a sinner. Jesus did not sin. We fully believe that. It is an essential tenet of our faith. And anybody who believes that Jesus had sin in his life will have a hard time being saved by somebody who's just like them. So Jesus wasn't just like us. But he hung around people that we struggle with hanging around. Who do you struggle with hanging around right now? Here's what I want you to notice. If you're not careful, if you prejudge people and you look at them because of where they come from or their skin color or where they've been or what they've done in their past, you will miss people that God wants you to love. That doesn't mean God wants you to participate in their sin. It doesn't mean God wants you to enable them. There are people that you should not give money to because they will go out and spend it on drugs. So you do not give them money to go spend on drugs. But we're all, there are all kind of people that we instantly push out of our lives that we need to go out of our way to love even though they're broken and messed up. Why? Because Jesus came for sinners, for the hurting, for the fallen. Is there anyone in your life that you need to forgive so that you can do that? Is there anyone who needs your help, but you haven't paid attention? Ask God to make you sensitive to those around you that are hurting. So we focus on the past. We choose prejudice. Number three, we worship religion and rules. I put these together and let me give you one word to look for in your life. You are not, I'm going to step on everybody's toes. So hang on. You can't love people when you're trying to control people. You can't love people when you're trying to control people. There is a difference between disciplining your children and controlling your children. If you're a teacher, there's a difference between disciplining your class and trying to fully control your class. And anybody who's been a teacher for any length of time knows how well it goes when your number one goal is to control your class. How many of you remember a teacher that you hate? Anybody remember a teacher you hate? I bet you when you think of that teacher, their number one goal was control. Time out. We all struggle with control. If we're not careful, the real reason we get mad at people is not because we don't agree with them. It's because we want to control their opinion. When somebody says to you, I don't believe what you believe, it should not make you angry. Did you hear me? Jesus did not get angry when people said, I don't believe in you. In one case of the rich young ruler, it actually felt, he felt sorry for him. It wasn't anger that he felt. Pity maybe. But not anger. And yet so often when somebody doesn't agree with us, the reason that we get so upset if we're honest about it is not because of what the person said. It's because how dare they not believe exactly what I believe the way I want them to believe. Now listen, that doesn't mean that some of your beliefs are not true. It does not believe, mean that what you believe doesn't matter. It does matter. And it is important But don't mix up telling somebody the truth with trying to control someone. 
Rules without relationship lead to rebellion in children. So you don't just try to put things out there and say, this is what you're going to do. And you can tell by how quickly you get angry if what you're doing is really out of love or out of control. See, the Pharisees had certain ways of doing things. They had always done them certain ways. And what they did is they took the Old Testament and they kept adding laws to the Old Testament. Some of them written, some of them oral. And between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, one of them liked oral more than written, and one liked written more than oral, and it doesn't really matter. They just kept adding to the law, so it got so crazy, they got to where there's only so many steps you can walk on the Sabbath. And yeah, you can go pull your, your cow out of the ditch, but you're not allowed to do this other thing to help somebody. They even made a rule where uh, you had to take care of your mother when she got sick, unless you gave her to God, and then you could just leave her. Crazy rules. And they weren't real rules. Listen to what happens here. In Matthew, we're going to pick up Matthew, Mark 2, excuse me, verse 18. Now the John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisee fast, but yours are not? Basically, why aren't you doing things the way we've done them? I mean, we've always hang hymns, hung hymns. We've always sung hymns at our church. How dare you not sing hymns? We've always had an organ in our church. By the way, did you know the early church thought that every instrument was secular? There's still churches that practice that. And there's churches today who still think the organ is somehow sacred. And yet the first, one of the first recorded people who loved organs was the man who killed all the early Christians. Don't mix up your rules with God's rules. How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They can't as long as they're with him. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day they'll fast. And then he says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And then he says, this, the Baptists don't like this next passage. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And so what Jesus is saying is, listen, it's okay to have different ways of doing things. And I believe what he's saying here is it's the heart that matters. Too often we judge people based on what they do instead of giving them grace and saying, well, I don't worship that way. I mean, I have friends who run around the building screaming and I don't worship that way. So my way is better. No, not necessarily. I have friends who sit still in service. There was a joke on the Babylon Bee this week that, that people came into a church and they thought everybody was dead or statues because they were sitting so still. There are friends of mine who worship at churches where literally, this is how they worship when they sing. And I could look at them and say, well, they're just not filled with the Spirit. But that's not true either. We look at forms God looks at the heart. And then it continues. Jesus was going through the grain fields. His disciples began to pick heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look. I love the look there. Why are they doing this? It's unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus answered, you never read what David did? And he goes back to the Old Testament. Jesus always went back to the Bible. In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread. They would put bread uh, uh, in the temple every week and would trade it out every week. And basically they gave David and his men the bread. It's lawful only for priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Listen, here's what Jesus is saying. You're more concerned about your rules than the people. You're making up new things and you're more concerned about the way you do things than the people that are doing them. And so here's my thing. Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're a person who's a manager at your workplace. You need to establish order. But make sure that you're not more concerned about order than the, you are about the people who you're trying to give order to. Do you see the difference? 
If you're disciplining your children, make sure you're more concerned about your children than having them follow the rules. Yes, it's important to follow the rules, but if you say, these are the rules because I love you, that's very different than because I said so. If we're not careful, we will miss the relationships around us. Missing the relationships around us. And you can miss relationships because you're concerned about some little dumb thing. You ever get mad about something and you miss the next thing because you were mad about the last thing? You ever been watching a TV show and you talk during it and realize you missed a critical plot point? At home, that's easy. You just rewind it, right? But you can't do that in life. Too often we go through life and because we're upset, because we're frustrated, we miss because of the past. Because of our prejudice, because of our rules, and in some cases our religion, we miss what really matters. They don't do it the way we do it, but do they love God? But do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do they believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Well, even though they do things differently than we do it, does it make us any better than they are? Let's not miss what God is doing. I want to encourage you this week to do something. Sometime during the day, Just say, God, is my heart focused on you today? When you find yourself upset, evaluate, am I upset because I want control? Or is there another reason? And for many of us, we find that the reason we get upset about things so often is because we wish we could control people. I say oftentimes I'd feel a lot better if I could just shake them. But it doesn't help. And it doesn't work. And the truth is, sometimes you just have to let people be who they are and say, God, I'm going to pray for them. I know they're pursuing things they shouldn't pursue. I'm going to pray for them. I'm not going to try to fix them. I'm not going to try to control them. I'm going to love them. But Father, I'm going to release them to you. That's what the Bible says to do even to enemies. Release them to him. There's a great prayer at the end that you can take with you. One of the things it says in this prayer is, Lord, help me to have a loving relationship with you and not just a religion to ease my conscience. I encourage you to do that this week. Say, God, I want a relationship with you. If you're watching online and you want to give your life to Christ, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender to him. You may know about Jesus, but the truth is you don't think a lot about surrendering your life to him. I encourage you, any area of your life that's not surrendered to him, to just say, God, I need you in this area of my life and surrender it. Maybe it's unforgiveness of somebody. You may not be ready to forgive yet. At least take the step to go, God, I don't want to forgive, but I know you want me to. Would you help me with that? Maybe in your life there's somebody that's hurt you. Maybe it's time to say, God, I release that to you. Maybe there's a a position that you've taken in life that you have a very strong feeling about. Maybe if you're honest, you know you've just been trying to control other people. Be honest with God. God, I know I'm right. (laughs) But help me not to choose control over love. Surrender that to him this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not walk in control, not to walk in religion, not to walk in our selfish ways and our selfish habits, but Father, to surrender every area of our life to you. Father, to not let us walk in judgment of others, but to know your truth that'll set us free and to be ones who share that with other people, not offended if they don't believe what we believe, but loving them all the same. Father, may we be light in a dark world. We may, may we be peace in a world full of strife. We receive that right now. Father, I pray right now a supernatural anointing right now for people who are watching that they would know your peace, your love, your joy. And Lord, even I pray, I know they say not to pray it, but I pray for your patience. Lord, we, we get taught it whether we want it or not. So we pray that you would give us that supernaturally. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't have a regular offering.